Welcome and thank you for attending my JSU capstone presentation. The title is Improving Vocabulary and Language at Boaz Intermediate School. I am Patricia Marlene Gregory Freeman, an EDS teacher, leader student in the Graduate Studies Program at Jacksonville State University. Let's start with the problem and purpose. Teachers at Boaz Intermediate School work hard to show gains in students' academics in all areas. Our historical data shows that we would like to see more growth with vocabulary development for all of our students and have our English language learners gain more English acquisition. Alabama's Hispanic growth has shown a lot of numbers with students in schools. In 1995, there was a little over 4,000 students in public schools. And in 2018, that number has risen to over 61,000. We have a large Hispanic population at Boaz Intermediate School. And we also have a large number of students in the poverty bracket. And we know that Hispanic students start school with fewer words than native speakers. Native speakers will know up to 5,000 English words possibly and then they just keep gaining the language and vocabulary while our Hispanic students may start with 5,000 in their home language uh, or their first language. They have those gaps to fill when they are learning the language and the vocabulary. And poverty students, there's been a lot of research that shows that poverty can affect their early vocabulary development and um, parents may not participate in an enriching conversations because of the plot of just providing for the family. Possibly they don't have books to read. So poverty affects learning. And according to Spring, uh, I'm sorry, according to Miriam Springer in her book, What Does the Research Say About Vocabulary? She says students from low income families are part of the at risk population who have heard fewer words and may have brains that are not as cognitively efficient for some of the work ahead of them in school and in life. However, she does go on to say, and we all know that the brain has the ability to change. Here at Boaz Intermediate School, the teachers show perseverance in doing everything they can to help these subgroups and all students. We have had multiple professional development sessions on how to help our English language learners. We have had book studies, speakers, professional learning communities, and we continue to find those best practices to provide as much growth for them as we possibly can. And the same is true of our poverty students. There have been book studies, professional development speakers, so that we understand how poverty affects learning. And we, have, we persevere because we want them all to have a brighter future. And the uh, growth of the Hispanic population numbers was provided by T.P. Crane in an Alabama.com article in 2018. This table by Ms. Christy Hopper in 2020 and updated recently shows our demographics of the poverty rate. For this year and the last five years, we have had over and still have over 70% on free and reduced lunch. This table shows our demographics by race. As you can see, the white race is the majority, but you can really see this increase in Hispanic population and last year it reached up to 43%. The numbers are a little down this year, but they tend to fluctuate. The black race for the years shown has been 6% or lower, Asian Pacific Islander 2% or lower, and other races 3% or lower. With English as a second language, we have a group of English language learners that get language acquisition from an ELL teacher. And again, you can see how these numbers have increased through the years. This year we have 68 in the English language learner program. Three are in their first year. We have five who are monitored or have completed. And then for our non ELL students that come from a home where English is not the first language, we have 67 students. So while we encourage them to celebrate their culture, not lose their first language, we know that they're not gaining as much vocabulary and language acquisition at home. They're hearing it just at school. 
This table was provided by Mr. Daly in 2020. There's more information in my references of everyone I've referred to. He provided information for all schools in Alabama. And this shows the proficiency rate for the Hispanic subgroup 2014 through 2019. During that time period, the highest uh, proficiency rate was 31% and the other years it was below 31%. I also have his table for our poverty subgroup. Um, the years 2018 and 2019, for some reason, weren't on the, on the charts that he provided in the article, but the students' um, high score was 38% in the poverty subgroup or lower during this time frame. Impact on our stakeholders. We have a lot of good things that we provide for parents as a school and then parents in the community provide a lot of good things for us. Uh, this list will also be in my appendices, but as you can see, um, we have parents and community that come in with many different things. I wanna mention our Pirate Foundation, which is a group of businesses and they provide grants for teachers. Um, with poverty, we have Christmas Coalition helping these students, a food program called Blessings in a Backpack. And the reason that I'm including some of our WIDA access scores on our impact on stakeholders is because when you saw that sign about Boaz, one thing that all stakeholders within the school and out in the community, they have embraced our Hispanic population and they work to help students. And um, I have seen many graduates that are Hispanic of Boaz High School in jobs such as teachers, teaching assistants, bank tellers in the medical profession. So the community have, has embraced them. The schools work hard to fill their gaps in language and we are seeing that our community is stronger for it. We celebrate that in 2018, we had 90% of our students that reached their way to access growth goal. In 2019-20, 93%. We can attribute possibly these, this decline in last year's number to 72%, which is still good, but possibly to COVID-19's health restrictions due to lack of discourse, peer conversation with social distancing and masks. The task force members and meetings. Faculty members on the task force include Jennifer Cox, Amanda Duckett, myself, Marty Hatley, Miss Hopper, Christy Hopper, Jeannie Prince, and Harolyn Roberts. Parents and students on the task force, we have as a parent Alicia Smith, who is also a Boaz Elementary teacher and has a son in fifth grade. Parker Hughes, a fifth grade student, and Allison Perez, a fifth grade student. Timeline of initial meetings on May 27th, I met with our instructional partner, Ms. Roberts, and our principal, Ms. Hopper, to discuss and approve this action research. June 7th, for another class, I had a Zoom meeting with part of the task force that data was presented and an idea to help with data, and we discussed already parent reports because these reports will show where the students place on their diagnostic test and also give suggestions for what, for what they can do to help their students at home in the, all, all the different components of reading, particularly the components of reading that they were below grade level. Um, and these reports are available in many languages. July 1st, I met with the task force minus one, the parent, and we, discussed the action, action research, two new strategies that we could implement to help with vocabulary and to continue to provide discourse with some of the strategies already in place. July 20th, I met with students during summer school and got feedback from them on two of the new programs that we had discussed with the task force that were the teachers. And, um, they, see, they liked the program on a first view, and we also discussed their feelings about the programs we've had in place. And on July 22nd, I met with Alicia Smith by phone, and we went over what was discussed at the July 1st meeting, and she thought everything sounded great, and she was particularly fond 
of one strategy called elevation that I'll speak more about because she had seen it as a teacher herself at Boaz Elementary. All right, the next step is decision process, possible limitations, and also I included proposed solutions with this step. Visual vocabulary was presented. It's a program that I designed. I may need to change the name. I found out that many people call certain programs visual vocabulary, but the limitation might be how students respond to it. Our Sunday upper elementary phonics program is great. We, we're in our third year. Uh, we talked about there was not really limitations, but pulling out those roots and affixes for vocabulary development. Elevation is the new program. It's targeted for ELL, but it's wonderful for all students. It's new since May of last year. There are so many wonderful strategies that a limitation might be just the time to research everything that could work for your class. But also it's heavy on discourse, that conversation, that language development for our ELL and all students. So there was concern of how we would start the year with COVID-19 health restrictions. Ready Reading has a great vocabulary uh, component. We have enjoyed this curriculum. We're in our third year. Again, our limitation could have been health restrictions with the discourse portion. And the iReady Reading Parent Report, it was pretty much already decided at this point that we would use it and we didn't see any limitations in sending those home. Our criteria for measurement, um, of course, we look at state scores that are available, that historical data, but iReady has a component where you can see, say, if I have a fifth grader, I can look at her third and fourth grade iReady scores. We've had the program for a while and see if this is a pattern that she's not showing growth or he's not showing growth, or if they have grown with that historical data, then we give the diagnostic test at the first of the year and students who place two or more grade levels below are placed in tier two or tier three, and they are monthly, have progress monitoring or what I already calls growth monitoring. With visual vocabulary, we use the pre-test, post-test approach, but also we're having two quarterly tests to see the progress. Our stakeholder feedback, where all the stakeholders on the task force have excitement, had excitement when we started the year that we had new programs. We were working hard for vocabulary development and helping our English language learners. We had determination to find a way, even though unfortunately the school year started with masks and social distancing, to get some of that discourse in those peer conversations because that's so helpful, especially for our ELL students. And we had a lot of hope that the restrictions would go away, which they are close to being gone and the mask mandate has been lifted. So we are working more with our former way of enjoying discourse with our students. Solutions, we just decided to implement everything in the proposed solutions, visual vocabulary, continue Sunday upper elementary phonics, continue with our ready reading core instruction and discourse, research those elevation strategies and implement them and share them. I ready the parent report, the diagnostic test, the gross reports, the historical data. And then using all of these, we plan to see growth in vocabulary and growth in our ELL students language. Implementation. On August 17th and 18th, we gave the I ready rate Reading diagnostic, this is our timeline. August 20th, 27th, we had a pretest and first week of visible vocabulary instruction. August 23rd through the 30th, all fourth and fifth grade teachers, which is what our schoolhouse is, taught the same context clues instruction to get our students digging into those strategies to help understand more vocabulary. And we also began our core reading program and our Sunday phonics. September 27th through 30th, we had researched and implemented some elevation strategies and discussed those during professional learning communities. October 4th through 8th was the iReady growth monitoring and also on the 8th, we had our visible vocabulary quarter test one. This is a quick demonstration of visible vocabulary. The students look at the images to see if they know what the middle word means, if they can get clues from the images. Then they reveal sentences about each image in the green, yellow, and blue sections, and that helps them see context clues with the word. 
Then they ask themselves, do I know from these clues what the word means? Then they can reveal the definition. Finally, they write that definition in their journal and then they write their own sentence using the word about the image in the red section. Elevation has so much that I could talk about, but I will try to make this brief. Like I said, there's so many wonderful strategies and wonderful components. One component is that just the ELL students that you serve, you can see their WIDA scores and see placement for these students. In the instruction component, they have ideas and strategies for every subject. And they also, not shown here, have a video of many of the strategies. This strategy is called Don't Mention It. This screenshot is from the video, and um, this helps ELL with speaking and listening, but it also was used for a academic vocabulary review. The teacher put academic vocabulary words uh, in a fishbowl for two different groups. The students would draw out a word, and another wonderful part of Elevation is that they will give you downloads of the graphic organizers that they suggest to use with the strategy. And then an amazing part is these are my ELL students initials. I've hidden their names and I will only see my students and they will tell me if they need high support, mid support or low level support on this particular skill and strategy. And they'll even give me suggestions on how to make accommodations to help these students with this activity. I had these that were high support, one mid support and one low level support for this particular skill and activity. And we are really enjoying that portion of the program. Interviews are available in depth in my appendices, but I would like to say that the students are really enjoying visible vocabulary. I could tell by their comments in the interviews, um, the teachers that implement it, which is myself, Ms. Prince, and Jennifer Cox, the ELA teachers, we have seen that the students like it and we're enjoying implementing it and we've seen some growth. Ms. Duckett taught fifth grade in the past and thinks it's a good thing that we have some new things for vocabulary. All of us are digging in those elevation strategies and sharing what we've enjoyed, Mr. Hatley, our ELL teacher is really fond of that. And Ms. Hawker and Ms. Roberts feel that anytime we're working collaboratively to help our students and help them grow in an area that we're doing good things for our school. Data, this is the visible vocabulary pretest and quarter one test, as you can see on the pretest, the mean was 62.12. And on the quarter one test, it was 82.33. Two. I'm sorry. This graph shows that the range of scores was between 20 and 100. And what's telling here is that this pretest, you can see there were a lot of numbers of students who scored low scores. And there was an average amount that scored high scores. It was kind of balanced, but then I enjoy looking at how this line narrowed of low scores when their mean scores went, mean score went up and it kept thickening on those higher scores. And so we hope when we give the quarter two test, we will see almost an invisible line on those low scores. iReady gives a diagnostic test, but iReady can't produce data for growth on growth monitoring until the students have tested twice and we're not to that point yet. So I made this graph to show that 28 students who were two or more years below grade level 14 of them grew 10 to 53 points between the diagnostic test and their first growth monitoring, five between two and nine. And this is telling the nine that grew between, that declined one to 63 points. We don't have a lot of students that decline like this. So that tells us they're not engaged, they're not giving their best. And so that helps us motivate them to do more and to do better because we know they're capable from their first diagnostic test and historical data. 19 students were on grade level or close to grade level. And we included these students this year to see how they were showing growth with our new programs and the things we're trying. And none of those students showed good growth and three more showed some growth and seven showed a decline. And again, some of them we don't feel like we're giving their best because there's not a good reason to decline from your first score that many points. So we use motivational strategies to encourage them to do their best.
adjustments. The mid-year second diagnostic reading test will be given November 30th and December 1st, and we'll use that data along with the visual vocabulary quarterly two test. And the task force will meet again in January to discuss this data and to make changes if necessary. Uh, these are my references. I am very thankful for joining me in this presentation, all of you. And um, I hope you have a great day.